So Yellowstone has has taught us in the scientific community a lot about uh, what happens to a place when, for instance, keystone predators like wolves are removed from a population. What happens when bison are hunted down from millions to a couple of dozen and what that does to the landscape and, and what it then looks like when you you change that and and start recovering populations, what it looks like to grizzly pair populations when you go from feeding them every night to just, you know, kind of overnight taking that food source away. Hey there, this is your host, Emmy Reed, and welcome back to the Voices of Greater Yellowstone podcast. This episode is the second part of our History of Yellowstone National Park series. So if you haven't listened to part one yet, I recommend starting there first. If you've already tuned in to part one, thanks for joining us again. In part one, we learned about Yellowstone's early history and establishment as a national park. This episode will dive more into what early tourism looked like, the romanticization of Teddy Roosevelt and Yellowstone National Park, and how Yellowstone National Park influenced conservation in the West and beyond. We're joined again by Alicia Murphy, Yellowstone National Park historian. Let's hop back into the conversation. I think the early years of Yellowstone, including the years uh, under the Army's management, which was 1886 to uh, 1919, uh, when the National Park Service really took over, and then those early years of the National Park Service's management, I think uh, we were really grappling with that very question, what does a national park mean? Um, You know, early accounts of people's times in the in Yellowstone, um, early newspaper articles, they talk about, oh, we went to the National Park last week. Um, you know, Bob and Mary just got back from visiting the National Park. Uh, it was obviously immediately thought of as a destination for vacation. Uh, you know, one of our early uh, international visitors was the Earl of Dunraven, for whom Dunraven Pass is named. Uh, and he came in and then later uh, published his accounting of this place, uh, which which boosted its uh, reputation, I guess uh, you could say, in Europe. So, you know, immediately we're getting this idea of okay, we need to visit and see this place. Um, We didn't have to teach people that a national park was a destination for the public. And it's in that enabling legislature, right? Like this is a pleasuring ground for the people. Um, We already have Central Park in New York. Uh, We have Hot Springs in Arkansas. And of course we have the Scenic Wonders in Yosemite that all, you know, kind of set precedent for people to think of a place or, or even Niagara, you know, this is, these are places to go and look at and experience. Uh, we're also coming up to the time where people are um, taking vacations and we're also, you know, I, I can't stress enough how the nation was re reestablishing itself after the civil war and reestablishing an American identity. Um, And so when we have a national park, this is America's answer to the great castles or, um, you know, the, the Coliseum, uh, you know, of Europe that, you know, they might've had all of this incredible ancient, you know, infrastructure, but look at our wonders. I mean, we are, we are just as good. America is just as good as, as Europe and, and any other civilized place. Right. Uh, And so um, all of these things kind of play together to, to create this, um, this destination for leisure time. What that obviously means though, is that the, early visitors to Yellowstone were by and large of the wealthy of the wealthy. (laughs) Um, Yellowstone is still extremely difficult to get to. I mean, you know, the the nearest um, settlement would have been Bozeman. 
Uh, and you know, that's a ways. I mean, it, it's, it's a kind of a drive, even in a car. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, and there's no infrastructure, uh, anywhere in the park. Um, uh, there was a little, um, somebody had tried to homestead at Mammoth, uh, in 1870 and 71. And they created a loosely could be called a hotel. Uh, and, um, you know, so there was like kind of a cabin that you could sleep on the floor and soak in the hot springs. Uh, and other than that, you were kind of on your own. So this, um, you know, you had to be both wealthy and quite adventurous early on to come to Yellowstone. The first hotel was finished in the park in um, 1883 at Mammoth. Um, they called it the National Hotel or the Mammoth Hot Springs Hotel. And um, so that's, you know, 1883, the park's already been around for 11 years by then. Uh, and so I think also, you know, Norris grappling with this idea of, okay, I need to build roads so that people can come here and recreate here, but I also need to stop them from killing all the animals. But they have to be able to kill animals to eat because there's no grocery stores in Yellowstone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and there's no grocery stores near Yellowstone, you know. Gardner's kind of a, a twinkle in people's eyes uh, early on. And, um, you know, West Yellowstone, you know, all, there was there was no um, infrastructure structure to support visitation uh, early on. So it was an evolving idea. And then, of course, the army got here, concessions, you know, started kind of ramping up and uh, becoming more and more influential and, uh, you know, building and building and building, partially funded and kind of bankrolled by the railroads. Uh, the Northern Pacific finally got to the park. The Union Pacific came in through West. Um, and then, you know... The national in 1916, the National Park Service is created, and then we have to kind of reevaluate once again what does it mean to have a national park. We didn't start getting other units until the well, the next unit created was Mackinac Island in 1875 as a national park. That was then turned back over to the state, um, so it's no longer a national park, obviously. But then in 1890, we got uh, Rock Creek, which is now part of the National Capital Parks. Uh, um, Sequoia and Yosemite were all turned into actual national parks in 1890. So we have a long time there where Yellowstone is really kind of it. And we're kind of trying to figure out what this looks like, which is even more challenging because of its remote nature um, and, and what, what it means. What, what, is, what does it mean to preserve uh, the resources and the, the scenic wonders? And, and what do we allow fires? <laughs> no, but how do we stop them? We don't have any funding. <laughs> you know? Good questions. Um, okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's those, all those things going to have to be worked through and it's a, it's an evolving picture. And, and, you know, in a lot of ways we're still evolving that today, right? We still uh, struggle with this dual mandate of protecting the resource while also providing the visitor experience. They are in a uh, manager's eyes, you know, we think of them as as equal uh, and and important, both important. But sometimes one has to win over the other, right? There's not always a perfect compromise. So we are still to this day trying to figure out what it means to be a national park in a lot of ways. A total work in progress, you know. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> We're always, I love it though. But it's like always just getting to the point of like, okay, we've got it to this point, but how do we make it better? How do we how do we preserve this place better? How do we, you know, make it enjoyable? Um, and that's evolved so much over the past years. And so it's it's just interesting to hear you talk about how it, even the things that they were thinking about at the inception of the park are still the things being thought about today. Yeah, I mean, we're always facing new challenges. And, um, you know, I said at the beginning that we of our talk that I like to look and see if we've you know, how can I help decision makers by by understanding what we did in the past? Um, of course, the challenging challenge to that is that there are always new things coming up um, and and new challenges that that we have to meet. And so there's not always a correlation in the past, although history does repeat itself in a lot of ways as well. 
if we don't learn from it, it will repeat itself. hundred yeah. percent. Um, what was, you talked a little bit about like, you know, it was hard to get to Yellowstone, but what, can you tell us more about what early tourism was like in Yellowstone? Um, what are some, like, what were some of the attractions? Are some of those things the still the same attractions today? And what, what are some things that maybe fell by the wayside? Yeah, early tourism to Yellowstone, at its most basic level, uh, is very similar to what happens today. Uh, people would come to Yellowstone. Uh, they would traverse our road system looking at wonders and then go home uh and that that whole that was what happened in the 1870s and it's what happens now um you know obviously thermal features has always have always been uh, a huge draw for yellowstone uh the old faithful geyser was named by the Washburn Expedition in 1870, uh, and Old Faithful has, um, you know, continued to be, you know, renowned. Uh, and I, I mean, I think it's because I don't. The Geyser has like the best PR firm. Um, <laughs> there's there's <laughs> other Geysers that are um, more reliable and uh, and you know, kind of more impressive when they erupt. Uh, but there's something about this idea of this faithfulness of this natural feature that I think uh, really stirs something in the human heart. Uh, so our, our thermal features, uh, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone uh, has always been uh, something that, that has held people wrapped um, and, and encouraged their visitation. You know, early, early on, animals weren't necessarily a draw like they are today. Uh, now our visitors rank, uh, you know, wildlife watching as, you know, one of the top three things that they come to visit um, to, to see animals. Um, you know, when the park was established, that was not necessarily the case. Um, but as animals became more and more rare across the continent, the fact that there's kind of this refuge in the heart of Yellowstone, particularly for animals like the bison, animals uh, became more important. Although I will say bears early on caught people's uh, hearts and minds. <laughs> um, black bears have been uh, a draw for the park for a very long time. Um, you know, there's uh, people would arrive in, you know, certainly. Uh, our earliest visitors would arrive at the park um, in what is now Gardner, and uh, they would get on stagecoaches. Um, and this is this is this is just like um, obviously there's exceptions to every rule, but this is what a typical visit would look like. Uh, once the railroad um, got close enough, they would arrive in the via the railroad in the 1880s. They would um, then. Get on these stagecoaches and uh, start their, uh, you know, five to seven day loop, kind of the grand tour of Yellowstone on road routes that are very similar to the roads that we have today. Um, you know, there's been slight uh, realignments along the way as we've, you know, had more engineering and different road um you know, basic road requirements uh, for automobiles. Uh, but essentially the route that early visitors took uh, is the same that, that visitors take today. Um, at that time, there were hotels uh, about a day's stagecoach ride apart. So many of those hotels have uh, since been abandoned, burned down, were uh, disassembled destroyed. Uh, but at that time, you know, you would have gone from Mammoth, your first night would have been at Mammoth, and then you would have gotten on the stagecoach and gone, you know, to, uh, say, the Norris Hotel, and then maybe to the Fountain Hotel, and then maybe over, you know, somewhere around Lake. Um, so there were, uh, you know, this was a, you saw Yellowstone at that time at a horse's pace. Um, you would stop at lunch spots and have a picnic lunch in the evenings uh you would dress up likely and um you know once there's hotels established and uh you would there would be 
dinner, I mean, the menus from this time are shockingly uh, well appointed. It's like, man, they they ate really well, uh, considering uh, how far they were from uh, any kind of like, I don't know, seafood. Um, there's a lot of uh, pretty impressive uh, menus in the early park. Um, there might be uh, music and dancing in the evenings. Um, and, you know, where you would be, you would be dressed up and you would, you would kind of, it would be a, almost like a ball in the evenings. Um, and then, uh, you know, you would make your loop and, and then head back out through uh, the north entrance. So, you know, now people, you know, do something very similar. They, they arrive at whatever entrance, either, you know, the West is now our more, most popular entrance, but then you go and you look at thermal features and you drive around, you look at the Grand Canyon, uh, you know, you probably stop and buy some souvenirs. Uh, there were early souvenirs as well in the um, 1880s, 90s, uh, early uh, 1900s. And so it's, it's, it's really similar. There were, you know, you could buy a postcard, send a postcard off. That's, <laughs> that's a, a well-established tradition in Yellowstone. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's a, and that's, that's one of the things that, you know, now we talk about challenges in the park. It's hard for us to envision a time when, um, you know, you aren't seeing Yellowstone in um, some kind of, uh, you know, on a road, you know, and you're, you're seeing it in a slow manner and you're stopping and looking at things as you come across them. Um, and so when we think about visitation management to this day, you know, that's, that's hard. And then we started allowing cars into the park in 1915 and that changed everything. Uh, to my mind, that's the most, uh, influential management decision anyone ever made was the the day they allowed cars into Yellowstone that that changed everything forever um, and created an entire you know generations of people that remember being in the car with their grandparents and um, you know stopping to feed bears and uh, stopping to to look at whatever you want to for however long you want to and then moving on to the next thing at your own pace and um, that tradition of kind of deciding what you, you know, choose your own adventure in Yellowstone uh, is very strongly ingrained in, in our visitors and, and has been for, I mean, decades and decades. It's bonkers to me that there were like bear feeding stations back in the, in the good old days where I remember I was like, no, oh, I don't believe it. I saw a photo. I was like, oh, yeah. And there is a sign to feed those those sweet little black bears. Um, I know. That, you got to do something with Reverse trash. that policy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Got to, got to. Got to do something with the trash, and and why not uh, help support our our furry friends uh, with it? <laughs> and um, you know, when you you talk about changing ideas of what a national park means, right. our relationship with wildlife is probably the um, biggest indicator of an evolution of thought um, that you could find in the park. Is is that you know what are what are we going to do with the animals that are here? That's so fascinating. So part of the language when establishing Yellowstone, and you had mentioned it too earlier on, but it was like, quotes, it was a public park or pleasuring ground for the benefit and enjoyment of the people, and kind of end quotes. However, people did not include indigenous people that had been, as we talked about earlier, traveling through, living on the landscape, um, or for since time immemorial and plus Yellowstone, the area, as we also talked about earlier, was being sort of marketed as this wild, untouched landscape um, when, again, indigenous people had been there um, forever. Can you talk a bit about the exclusion of indigenous people when the park was established and how Yellowstone is now working to work with tribes to enhance indigenous connection to the park? Sure. I think, you know, we talk a little bit about where Yellowstone fits into a larger story of the nation's history. And I think it's um, important to understand where Yellowstone sits in relation to the federal government's um, 
and the public's understanding of the relationship between tribes and the, the United States government. You know, by the time the park is established in 1872, um, most of the area tribes, or indeed most of the tribes on the continent, although certainly not all, uh, had been entered into treaties, which are official government to government uh, documents and agreements, um, entered into treaties where they would be removing to reservation lands. Um, so Yellowstone by 1872 is in the midst of a landscape where it's not that Yellowstone in particular, that Native people weren't allowed into Yellowstone in particular. It's that Native people weren't allowed elsewhere in the nation other than on their reservations. Um, and so there was still quite a lot of uncertainty and fear um, about what was happening out West. Um, you know, uh, the, the park was established before, for instance, the Battle of Little Bighorn, um, where the U.S. Army was soundly defeated. Um, and uh, in 1877, uh, the army pursued um, a band of the Nez Perce uh, tribe that were fleeing the army uh, because they did not uh, want to go on reservations. Uh, and they fled through uh, Yellowstone, and uh, while they were in the park, uh, they did kidnap several visitors and then killed several visitors uh, in the park um, on their tragic flight uh, trying to get to uh, Canada and Sitting Bull. So uh, early park managers, I think if you want to, you know, I'm a historian, I try to understand the past through the past's eyes, right? Um, and I think early park people, you know, park managers uh, were trying to highlight that um, people didn't need to be afraid to come to Yellowstone, that people could come here safely. Um, this wasn't, you know, they weren't going to be caught up in another situation like what happened in 1877. Um, you know, Norris's early uh, re annual reports were um, widely read, and he talks a lot about, uh, you know, maybe we should cede back that Montana Strip uh, to the Crow Nation. Um, maybe, you know, talks about all of the archaeology he found. He talks about uh, some of the uh, sheep eater or Tukadika natives that were still living uh, in the park and talks, talks about coming across some of them, um, although there were very few at that time. Um, there were never any military actions or actions by civilians uh, that uh, were that that physically removed uh, tribal members from Yellowstone. Um, this happened, you know, in this larger uh, atmosphere of of all tribal members being encouraged to to move to reservations. So. Um, you know, this is a, a tough thing to think about. Um, you also, you know, tribal members were not automatically American citizens at this time. It wasn't until, uh, let's see, 1924 uh, that tribal members were automatically uh, considered American citizens. Um, and I think that probably had a lot to play in this as well. Um, but but more importantly is just where in time we are in the, the federal government's relationship to these uh, tribal entities. Um, so, and, and these early boosters really did want to make this a a, a appealing place to come and bring your, you know, bring your family. <laughs> and uh, it, this was a, a safe place full of wonders and um, come on down. <laughs> and uh, so I think, I think those are uh, the factors that led to the, the, 
landscape that that we see where um, there's this kind of story that you know yeah there've there've been Native Americans throughout this area uh, but they're not currently here and and I think that's largely true um, and it's just because of where in time and place uh, Yellowstone was established. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what is Yellowstone doing now to work with tribes to um, have more of a connection to the park? You know, I think uh, we have traveled to tribal consultations with our associated tribes, um, and that's very official, uh, formal. And, you know, this is this would be like if we were having, um, you know, an ambassador from Canada or England or, you know, any nation, uh, that's the level of uh, relationship that we have with tribal governments uh, so that we have this official uh, consultation with them on actions. Uh, But we also have informal relationships that are very important. We work strongly with the tribes, especially like on issues like bison management. Um, You know, the bison being incredibly important to many tribes uh, in this area and beyond. We also, I think, have made some really positive steps forward, particularly in things like the uh, Tribal Heritage Center at Old Faithful. This was its third year uh, that has been going on. Um, We established the Tribal Heritage Center on our 150th anniversary year. uh, So that was in 2022, uh, where um, members of our associated tribes come and um, they spend, you know, several days down staying at Old Faithful. And they're there during the day. It's open to the public and people can come in and learn about uh, traditional you know, whatever the person wants to talk about, whether this is, you know, storytelling or this is braiding sweetgrass or, um, you know, beading clothing or moccasins or, um, you know, traditional foods. Um, There's just, it's remarkable and an amazing opportunity uh, for this kind of relationship and to remember that um, the tribes have, have, as you say, always been here. Um, And, they have never left either. Um, you know, we want tribal people to feel comfortable coming to Yellowstone. Um, and I think, I hope that that story and that message is getting out to the public, um, that this is important. Uh, this summer is the first summer that we've had, um, through a relationship with mountain time arts. There are uh, teepees at each of the park's entrances. Uh, and so, you know, when you approach Yellowstone right away, you realize this is a place that indigenous people have lived. This, you know, this is a representation of their homes right here at the entrance. And so I'm, I hope, and I think that's the purpose of these, um, installations is to remind people of the landscape that they are, they are on, um, is more than just kind of like, a wilderness Disney world, right? This is also a meaningful and sacred place to, to many people. Um, and, and those people have a strong and enduring connection to Yellowstone. I I love two of the things that you mentioned for sure. The, the heritage center, which I've been to, and I got to braid some sweet grass and I took it home with me and now it rests on the dashboard of my vehicle to help me have a safe (laughs) journey when I, um, head out. And then also, yeah, your um, partnership with Mountain Time Arts, the Yellowstone Revealed um, events that you've had were so spectacular and special and just really showed the beautiful connection it, in the park. And um, I had a lovely time. So if our listeners are maybe in the park or headed to the park soon, make sure to check out the Heritage Center. And um, if you're managing to time it also with um Yellowstone reveal definitely check that out too 100% yeah yeah I you know um the first year that Mountain Time Arts uh was uh, active in the park was um in uh, on our 150th year 2022 uh, where they had a teepee village at the Madison Junction and um it was being there was um, remarkable uh, to see, you know, kind of a line of teepees representing um, 
all of our associated tribes uh, and, um, you know, tribal members were there talking to the members of the public and explaining their long connections to the landscape. Um, but I encourage people to look up um, imagery online of what those teepees look like. There's some images of, um, you know, kind of from the distance of the, the teepees right there on the river bottom with morning mist kind of rolling through and the, the morning light shining on them that, um, you know, even just thinking about it now, I kind of get goosebumps. I mean, they it, it was a very striking image um, and it, it brought up you know, I think people's feelings, uh, you know, complex feelings about the landscape and relationships and, and what our, our current understanding of, of, you know, race relations, I mean, all kinds of things in um, America, I think were evoked uh, by seeing those TPs at Madison Junction. I talked to many people who, you know, conveyed that to me, um, and how, uh, important that was to them and um, for a variety of reasons. And so I, I think that that those feelings can still be, you know, even though they're not still on the landscape um, today, the imagery of them is very powerful. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, oh, I want to talk a bit about so maybe some presidents, because we were talking earlier about how <laughs> It's sometimes kind of surprising when people learn that President Grant was the one that signed Yellowstone National Park into existence. And I think the president we all often associate with Yellowstone is good old Teddy Roosevelt. Um, but he was not associated in its creation. You know, he was, wasn't even wasn't president then. <laughs> um, can you tell us a bit about why he seems to have this legacy with the park and how even maybe Yellowstone itself influenced him? Yeah, I, I've had people be shocked and and even kind of argumentative uh, with me when I, I mentioned that Teddy Roosevelt did not uh, sign the Yellowstone Park Act, nor did he establish a National Park Service. Um, uh, that was President Wilson who signed the organic act for the service. Uh, so, you know, Theodore Roosevelt, um, was to his bedrock, uh, an advocate for wild spaces. I think you could say, um, certainly was, had a love affair with the West, uh, going back to his time, uh, being a rancher in, uh, North Dakota, and uh, seeing this landscape as a young man and, and kind of becoming TR at that, in this place. Um, he also had a lifelong passion for hunting. Um, you know, hunting um, to many people's puzzlement uh, has been at the heart of wildlife conservation uh, for the you know existence of wildlife conservation in America, hunters have been uh, drivers of that. Um, and so you know, Teddy Roosevelt uh, started the Boone and Crockett Club, which uh, is an organization that uh, has a lot of influence in conservation circles. And um, so I, you know, I think he saw and and some of his uh, contemporaries saw Yellowstone as kind of a almost like a nursery for wildlife uh, where, you know, you wouldn't be able to hunt in the park, uh, but the animals would leave the park and become available then. Um, and, and that is true. I mean, there's a, a uh, anybody who lives in Montana knows or, or Wyoming or Idaho knows that uh, there is a, a very robust um, outfitting and hunting uh, culture and um, business businesses here in this area and they are um, especially strong in our gateway communities um, around Yellowstone. We also uh, have, uh, of course, we've got the Roosevelt Arch that you go through that was uh, built in uh, 19, finished in 1904. Uh, and so Roosevelt was there to help lay the cornerstone against his will. He was actually in the park on vacation, just like any old tourist, although he had like a military escort. Um, but uh, he did his best to disconnect from Washington while he was in the park and, and um, 
you know, just be, just be kind of a boy again and, and camp out and um, kind of play uh, for his time in Yellowstone. And then as he was leaving, he begrudgingly uh, attended the, the ceremony for the Roosevelt Arch. And then we have our Roosevelt Lodge uh, and kind of developed area. Uh, and it was so named uh, as a marketing ploy, basically, uh, to get people to want to stay there. It's in the general area of one of the places that uh, Roosevelt camped at on his vacation. So, um, you know, I think those things keep Roosevelt in people's minds, um, unlike Grant Village, which is kind of out of the way and most people don't ever go to it. <laughs> um, you know, that's that doesn't really like um, inspire a person uh, like sitting on the front porch of the Roosevelt Lodge or going through the Roosevelt Arch. You know, that makes a little bit more of an impression on you. Um, and then, um, you know, I don't think you can underestimate um, the teddy bear as, you know, what animal is more evocative of Yellowstone and the president, and that is the the black bear uh, upon which the the teddy bear is modeled, and and um, you know was named for Theodore Roosevelt. Um, although his famous uh, experience of of not shooting a bear cub um, was not in Yellowstone, but people still tie the the creature to both Yellowstone and the president, and so I think that's a a further uh, thing. I. I think people are shattered when I have to explain that, you know, Roosevelt um, was kind of just a, just like you, just somebody who wanted to come and enjoy this place and really liked it. Uh, and if you really want to see his incredibly important um, impact on our wild lands, you might look at something like Devil's Tower with the Antiquities Act that he signed um, and Devil's Tower being our first national monument. Or the Forest Service, which he was very instrumental in creating and building up. Um, and of course, the forest is an important partner in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and, and our, our public lands that we are so fortunate to have in this part of the world. Um, and so I, d I don't want to dismiss Theodore Roosevelt's incredible importance uh, to conservation. He just He just wasn't as important to Yellowstone's creation as many people want him to be. <laughs> he was just a tourist. He was just He's just a tourist. <laughs> out, enjoying it. That's interesting. And I bet that will really blow a lot of people's minds, which <laughs> is always a good experience to have. That's right. So Yellowstone National Park is practically attached to another very famous national park, good old Grand Teton National Park, just south. Um how did Yellowstone play a role in establishing Grand Teton, if at all? Yeah, there was a time when there was the idea that really uh, we, we as the federal government should annex, you know, kind of the, what is now Grand Teton National Park um, and make it one big park. Mm -hmm. uh you know let's let's have this let's just all have it under one umbrella we'll call that you know i like to think of it as like yellowstone south <laughs> um and uh you know that um that was certainly an idea uh for a long time um our first national park service superintendent horace albright uh who was incredibly influential in establishing the service along with stephen mather uh he was kind of stephen mather's right hand man uh and you know uh had kind of his pick of assignments once the service was kind of set up and we kind of knew what we were doing a little bit uh albright uh took a superintendency um, at one of the parks and was able to choose his favorite park at that time, which was Yellowstone. Uh, so he was our first, uh, he was in the park for 10 years um, as our first National Park Service superintendent. Um, but I'd say as much as uh, Albright loved Yellowstone and was passionate about uh, the parks in general and um you know, for the rest of his life, even, uh, you know, he went on to become the part, the service's second director and was, um, you know, very influential in uh, 
the National Park Service's early years. Um, even once he retired from National Park Service and went into private industry, he continued to, to uh, you know, kind of keep his hand in or uh, keep an oar in on uh, trying to to help guide uh, Park Service policy regarding Yellowstone and and other parks. But I would say, uh, all that being said, uh, that there could be a case uh, for Albright's true true love uh, was the um, area that would become Grand Teton National Park. Uh, he um, lobbied and advocated and schmoozed um, tirelessly uh, to create that national park um, and ultimately found his kind of uh, partner in arms in that, uh, in the Rockefeller family, John D. Rockefeller Jr. in particular, uh, who ended up uh, using his family's money to um, kind of anonymously buy up uh, many of the dude ranches uh, in the uh, Jackson Hole area and then donate them to the Park Service to um, cobble together uh, that beautiful area to the South. As far as why it did not just become part of Yellowstone, you know, I, I am not a scholar. I'm, I'm very focused on Yellowstone. I'm not a scholar of other parks very well. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm fascinated uh, because of um, a personal love of the Tetons. So I'm, I'm fascinated by all the dude ranches and, and what a, a, great history that the Tetons have that I don't think many people truly appreciate. Um, but I can say, so, so that to saying that I don't necessarily know the ins and outs of why the Tetons were set aside as a separate national park, why they didn't go ahead and make it into one. Although I will say that Yellowstone is already huge. Um, at the time, it was the largest national park. Uh, it remained the largest national park until the establishment of Death Valley. And then, of course, our Alaskan parks uh, dwarf all of them. Uh, but, uh, you know, in the uh, 19 teens and 20s, uh, Yellowstone was the biggest. And um, it's hard to manage a landscape this size. And, um, you know, the further you get from Mammoth, uh, the further you get from leadership and the harder it is to kind of keep track of what's going on. And so I think when I think now um, what that would be like if we were also trying to uh, manage a place that's even further away, um, we would have had to change things pretty drastically in Yellowstone to make that work, I think, um, you know, cause some kind of more centralized headquarters. But um, I, I think that just, I think the sheer size of Yellowstone was like, you know, I think we're, we're good enough here <laughs> uh, and we can have uh, the Tetons be its own separate entity, its own separate draw. I think there was also a lot of local boosterism um, in the town of Jackson, Wyoming itself, uh, you know, where they wanted to be their own separate entity. Um, and, and that is just kind of how it worked out. But you know, I think Yellowstone has been the inspiration for parks around the world, um, as well as, you know, our nearest and closest and dearest neighbor. Uh, but, um, you know, we still have parks from uh, countries all over the globe that uh, contact Yellowstone or come visit Yellowstone and, and study Yellowstone um, as kind of their... Uh, bedrock on how they want to manage parks in other places. And so um, it makes sense that that would um, have that influence even so close nearby as well. How has the establishment of Yellowstone National Park influenced conservation in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, both back at its conception and maybe also in the present day? You know, when Yellowstone was established, conservation it was certainly a theory, right? Um, but we didn't have words necessarily or the understandings um, of things like ecosystem. Um, you know, our early um, 
scientists were called naturalists. Um, you know, we had um, a very elementary understanding of kind of how nature all fits together. And um, I think Yellowstone, as Hayden uh, wanted and predicted, Yellowstone uh, became a, a living laboratory uh, where a lot of conservation ideas could be kind of played with and examined and studied. Um, I think many people don't realize the incredible value of uh, Yellowstone to uh, wildlife biology, to understanding, um, you know, how animals and vegetation interact, for instance, um, how different types of animals, uh, you know, kind of create the, you know, trophic cascades and all that kind of stuff. I mean, early on, uh, there was a uh, concerted and enthusiastic uh, push to um, eradicate all predators from Yellowstone with the exception, of course, of bears. Um, but by the twenties, we no longer had wolves in Yellowstone. Um, we had essentially decimated the mountain lion population. Uh, we enthusiastically killed coyotes, uh, by the dozens, if not hundreds every year, um, and were, um, rewarded for that. Uh, it was a, a systematic erasing of what they considered bad animals in order pr to protect the good animals in the park. Uh, good animals being elk, bison, pronghorn antelope, uh, deer, <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, moose, all of these, these good animals uh, were in danger of, of, being uh, predated on by the bad animals. And so we were here to save the day. Um, not understanding <laughs> how uh, wildlife populations interact, not having really any clue uh, of, of the damage they were doing by eradicating predators, which are so critical to the health of an ecosystem. Um, you know, and so at one point, um, you know, even the good animals were in danger of extinction, like the bison. I mean, we went from millions of bison on the landscape in the United States to um, a little over two dozen truly wild, you know, what we consider purebred bison, uh, purely genetically bison that hadn't been uh, mingled with cattle, domestic cattle, um, left in the world. And they were in the heart of Yellowstone. Um, that is the one of the reasons that the U.S. Army was invited to come and manage Yellowstone uh, for 33 years was to stop the poaching of bison um, and elk, um, because there was this real concern that, oh no, <laughs> we're going to lose this animal, uh, and that would be a tragedy. So, you know. Are early on, I mean, the Lacey Act, uh, which officially stopped hunting and in Yellowstone and made it illegal with actual legal ramifications, uh, was signed in um, 1894. Uh, and, you know, that was kind of the first major, I think you could consider conservation law I, um, that you can really point to to protect wildlife. Um, certainly it's the law that we still, uh, rely on today to stop, uh, any, you know, requests for hunting in Yellowstone. It's against the law to do so. And, um, so I think, you know, from 1894 on, we've kind of had this un uncomfortable relationship of like, okay, should we be feeding animals? Should we have bear pits where animals come and eat trash and, and the bears um, have nightly shows uh, and we, we help um, bolster their nutrition <laughs> in that way? Uh, should we be buying hay and, and harvesting hay in the park and feeding that to elk and pronghorn and bison? Um, you know, we brought in a bison that had been rounded up on the prairie 
uh, from Texas and brought up and had a domestic herd that we ranched in Lamar Valley for decades. Uh, and then ultimately kind of decided that they should be free ranging and part of the wild herd. Um, you know, so we've had this kind of, uh, and then obviously to the reintroduction of the wolves in 1995. I mean, that's a huge conservation uh, milestone. And so Yellowstone is a, Yellowstone's a story of best intentions a lot of the times. Um, and we are always trying to do what we think is right with the knowledge that we have. Um, and we can look back and say, wow, we made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> um, but we can also say, give ourselves a little bit of grace by saying, well, that was what we thought was the right idea at the time. And um, so Yellowstone has has taught us in the scientific community a lot about uh, what happens to a place when, for instance, keystone predators like wolves are removed from a population. Um, what happens when bison are hunted down um, from millions to a couple of dozen and what that does to the landscape and, and what it then looks like when you you change that and and start recovering populations, what it looks like to grizzly pair populations when you go from feeding them every night to just, you know, kind of overnight taking that food source away. Uh, and, you know, how do bears adapt? What is it like when, um, you know, cutthroat trout who spawn in shallow waters are eradicated from the landscape by lake trout, an invasive species that, um, you know, they spawn in deep waters and, and deprive bears of that food source. You know, these are all actions and reactions and reactions to reactions uh, that humans have taken uh, on this landscape. And, um, you know, we are this, we are always learning and I am always wondering, you know, what are we going to look back a hundred years from now and think, man, they sure got that wrong. Uh, but also, man, they sure got that right. Um, and, and, you know, what, what are going to be some of those turning points in conservation understanding that, that find their roots in Yellowstone and other wild places like Yellowstone, Yellowstone being at the heart of a large ecosystem of wildlands, a temp large, one of the largest temperate intact ecosystems in the world, you know, lands itself particularly well. Again, it's that, that kind of fortuitous location in time and space uh, that that lends Yellowstone. It's kind of, I don't want to say exceptionalism, but um, it's unique position to be able to influence and um, provide that living laboratory um, for conservation efforts. Yeah. Conservation is, yeah, always evolving. And so often based on what we say is like the best available science and that best available science is growing and changing each year. And it's just, it's an interesting journey to watch. It is. <laughs> it is. It is. And, you know, I think when I look back through superintendent reports or correspondence in our archives and, um, you know, I, I think that is the thing is that people were trying their best and um, I think that is one of the things that I'm most proud of being part of is an organization that is dedicated to the mission of protecting our resources and what that protection looks like has changed over time. Uh, but it has always been and remains kind of the heart of uh, Yellowstone staff, as well as the service as, as an organization, the National Park Service as an organization. And I think um, I, it is an honor to be part of that tradition. Yeah. Um, speaking of conservation, Alicia, this is a question we ask every single guest that we have on the podcast. Who is your conservation hero? You know, I, I look back at Yellowstone's history and there are some really important um, conservationists that made important um, contributions to our understanding of of this place and conservation and landscape ecology. Um, and then of course there's kind of this like broader understanding. I mean, you could even look at somebody like um, Henry David Thoreau as a, um, a conservation hero. You know, I mean, you, you can look outside the sciences to, to look for heroes um, 
as is my want as a humanities uh, person uh, <laughs> and not a scientist. Um, um, but I think uh, the person that I'm currently kind of uh, academically crushing on right now, um, although I have a, a running list of people that I'm intrigued by uh, in Yellowstone's history, right now I'm, I'm really uh, appreciating uh, George Bird Grinnell uh, as a conservationist and, you know, he wasn't, um, he didn't spend a ton of time in Yellowstone, although he did visit here and he was, um, very active politically for Yellowstone and national parks, uh, and of course, bison conservation. Uh, he was, um, you know, the, um, he grew up next door neighbors, uh, with the Audubon family. And so he was the, uh, he started the Audubon Society. Uh, he also was incredibly influential in establishing my other favorite national park, which is uh, Glacier National Park. Um, and he uh, was important in establishing the Migratory Bird Act and stopping this kind of wanton destruction of birds uh, for their feathers for ladies' hats. <laughs> um, the, the guy was... was impressively dedicated uh, to conservation and to wildlife. He was a personal friend of Theodore Roosevelt, co-founder of the Boone and Crockett Club. He also uh, was very concerned with and focused on uh, area tribes and, um, you know, kind of fighting for their rights. Um, and so I find him fascinating and, um, yeah, I think for now, we'll just go with my, he's my current conservation crush. <laughs> I love that it's because it's so much, I, one of the reasons I love asking this question is because of the variety of answers we get from like the really well-known kind of pillars of what we view as conservation to people being like, yeah, it was my, it was my mom, it was my dad and yeah. everything in between all the yeah. kind of like little niche <laughs> conservation heroes that <laughs> played a very important role, but maybe aren't, you know, as big of names as maybe we think of Charles Darwin or David Attenborough or Steve Irwin and th that kind of vein. So John Muir. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's so yeah. many that people can pull from. And so it's always fun to hear of like who is influenced and like, you know, having yourself a historian on as opposed to oftentimes we have scientists, biologists mm. on. And so sure. it, it's fun to get a variety of answers <laughs> and also share with our listeners someone they may not have heard of before and can go learn more about. Alicia, thank you so much for being on the podcast. And thank you for all of your work preserving the history of America's first national park. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you today. Oh, thank you. This has been great. Thank you. Thanks. An enormous thank you to Alicia Murphy for stopping by the podcast and for chatting with me for a very long time on all things Yellowstone history. Alicia, I'm happy to talk history with you anytime. To all my history nerds listening in, I'm so sorry, but during the show, I forgot to ask Alicia for her book recommendations on Yellowstone history. I followed up with her later, and she recommends Empire of Shadows, The Epic Story of Yellowstone by George Black, Yellowstone, A Wilderness Besieged by Richard Bartlett, and Do Not Feed the Bears, The Fitful History of Wildlife and Tourists in Yellowstone by Alice Wondrak Beal. I will place links to these books in the show notes to anyone wanting to learn more. The Voices of Greater Yellowstone is a podcast by the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, a conservation nonprofit that works with all people to protect the lands, waters, and wildlife of the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. If you're newer to the podcast and haven't heard of our organization before, you can head over to our website to see what we're working on and how we're keeping the special landscape as it is. Please share this podcast far and wide or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts to help us reach new audiences with the stories and science of the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. As always, thanks for stopping by and we'll see you next time.